Okay. Here's the fun thing as I'm talking about this. I've got my square bottle in here. It's my chihuahua. Don't do that in an interview. It's distracting. I mean, it happens. Come on. We're all interviewing at home, but do your best to be in a quiet space. So hold on a second while I deal with the chihuahua. Just a second. Shh. Shh. Yes, a square bottle for my little dog. He gets so ashamed. That poor thing. He has to deal with so much. He even has a diaper. I know. I know. Anyway. <laughs> so moving on away from Spencer, even though that's a really good point, do your best to, to take care of things that are going on. In fact, during the interviews today, the there's some things that we just have no control over. Um, we have a lot of pets in our house, but also the lawnmower people for our neighbors decided to come by and mow the lawn and do the weed whacking. And of course, when it's my turn to read the interview question, it's right by my window. So life happens. Make it a joke. Make it funny. Roll with the punches, right? We are all at home. This is all brand new to us, but do your best to be in a quiet place so that things like that don't happen which brings me to another point this kind of goes without saying and i hope you already knew this but um it's okay to have water or something to drink at least for me my throat gets very very dry um and so you just say that I, if people understand too just say do you mind if you know just have water but don't put it near your computer where you're just gonna be like oh my gosh oh and then it gets all over your computer mm, no i have mine sitting on the windowsill right here so that i can take a drink when i need to um, and don't eat. Okay. Don't eat. <laughs> Again, goes without saying, but, um, and I honestly, nobody did that in the last couple days, but you never know. Some people do stuff like that. Don't be that one because I tell you what, you will be infamous and you won't even know it. The worst, uh -uh. just don't eat. And if you can go without drinking, go without drinking. And definitely if you drink, make sure it's clear liquid water. Mine's not. It's coffee. But, you know. Anyway, ask questions. I, when you're done with your interview, ask a question. There's some really good questions that are listed on Pinterest. I think some of the best questions that I know that we like to hear is asking why, why you should work at a certain building. Like, why should I want to work with you? But wording that in a way that doesn't sound demeaning, like, look at me, I'm amazing. Um, don't be pompous, be arrogant. Um, don't, don't do that. Don't be arrogant. Um, be confident, uh, transparent, humble, but also uh, reflective and say, I hear that, you know, this building is a great building to be at. Um, I've heard a lot of great things, but I'd like to hear from you about why you think this would be an amazing place for me to work. Another good question um, that we've heard that I thought was really good and um, hit the interview team very, very well, and I've also seen on Pinterest is, if you were to hire me today, this very, very minute, what sort of reservations might you have about hiring me as a teacher? That is instant feedback, and it is a very difficult question to ask, but because of the bravery of that question, wow, it just made me appreciate that person so much more because that's a really hard question to ask. And if you're anything like me, I know that we're not supposed to take things personal um, as a teacher or when we're interviewing, but it is so personal to us because it's really a part of who we are. So even though we know we're not supposed to, sometimes, you know, it, we can get hurt feelings and we're human beings and those things are hard. Um, so to be willing to invite others that you might not know or even people that you do know to offer feedback for you will help you if you don't get that job to maybe get the next one because you're getting instant feedback in the minute. And not all principals can or are willing to call applicants back to provide feedback on how the interview process went. And interviewing is very hard. And it's okay to say that you're nervous, okay? It's, it's okay to be human. We are all human. We're teachers. We love what we do. We love kids. We want to love the people that we work with. And hopefully that's the kind of building that you're applying to as well. Um, another thing, uh, talk about best practices. 
Um, but if you talk about best practices, it's really, really good if you can talk about the research behind it and any sort of statistics about why it is that you do a certain thing. So I'm just off the top of my head, and this wasn't brought up in an interview, but what I'm thinking about is homework. Homework can be a, a kind of a hot topic with different buildings. Some people say, no homework because we can't monitor whether or not they're doing it at home. Um, we don't know if it's going to come back. It's not necessarily fair or equitable. Um, it doesn't necessarily show to improve um, test scores. Or you have someone like me who's actually on the flip side. I teach kindergarten and I do provide homework. I provide it as optional so that parents who want the opportunities to help their children who might not know how otherwise, it's a way for me to communicate with families and help kids get into the habit of having a homework place at home where they can practice. Plus, I know that my kids love to learn. So I don't send paper pencil homework. I send things like games and things that are interactive. So I find a way to make it more positive and show that this actually increases my parent engagement levels and that families really love it and it makes the kids feel grown up, but also it prepares them for future grades because I help prepare parents to remind them that kids need a special place at home just to do their work. Um, and usually it's not in your bedroom. Um, it might be at the dinner table. It might be at like, I forget what that is, like the little bar in the kitchen. I don't have one. I really, really want one someday. Sidebar. Um, but yeah, uh, having a specific place, a time or a set amount of time. And it also teaches parents to engage with their children. So if you have a reason for it or you have statistics behind it, um, you can prevent, uh, present it both ways but make sure that you're talking about best practices and maybe the research behind it and why you choose to do it. Um, it goes without saying you should have learning targets posted in your classroom and be able to communicate to your kids what it is that they're learning and why it is important and how you might do it in a way that is engaging to both kids and families because we have a lot of new jargon in our, excuse me, in our teaching community that um, hasn't existed before. Um, kindergarten, at least for me, it's not what it used to be when I went to kindergarten. It's the new first grade. It's got entirely different new standards, which is interesting COVID crisis wise. So make sure that you talk about how your best practices engage families and how it creates um, like a wraparound support for all families. Talk about when you're talking about collaboration and communication about how you talk with your um, school counselor. All kids have now experienced trauma. 100%. If they have been in the school system, they have now experienced a huge trauma event being ripped out of a classroom. And for me, I would draw on my understanding of grief and loss as a social worker and talk to that. Talk about how you address trauma inside your classroom. Talk to the trainings that you've had, but also give specific strategies. You're going to want to use buzzwords, okay? You wanna use things like trauma-informed practices, restorative practices, PBIS, um, break spaces, um, different ways for kids to communicate their feelings and how do they talk to each other and how do you do have uh, restorative conversations. You want to bring in all those buzzwords, but to just list the definitions like that is not enough. Talk about how you specifically integrate that in your classroom in a way that provides community support. Um, one of the things that I tell uh, my families is that, hey, when your kids are in my class, please don't be offended if I call on my kids when I'm referring to someone else because they are like my kids. When I'm here, I will cherish them so much and I tell them that I love them. If that makes you feel uncomfortable, please let me know and I would love to be um, an example to them and tell them a way that I care if there's another way that you prefer. Also show how you partner with parents. To say that you partner with parents and do um, maybe uh, conferences, fine, we, we all do conferences. What does your conference look like? Um, I think that's actually one of my strengths is really working with parents at conference time and giving them reassurance and letting them know that they're a student's first teacher. And so I value their input and it's not something I just say, I really value a parent's input because nobody knows their child 
better than them. Nobody is a better advocate for their kid than them, but sometimes it takes a little bit to try to figure out and help navigate a school system, especially if it's something that has been not trustworthy to you in the past. And that depends on the education, the background, and your experience within a school system. So showing parents that they are valued, that you love to have them in there to volunteer, that they can stop by, but also making sure that you let them know and setting up boundaries with parents because there can be helicopter parents. If you've been a teacher before, you haven't had those, right? Not at all, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. We've all had helicopter parents, which you know what? I try to think about it this way. Those parents are the biggest advocate for their kid, but you still need to set up boundaries as a teacher as well. How do you set up boundaries with parents and also keep an open door policy? For me, it's creating appointments. So um, when I teach kindergarten, when they're coming in for the day, probably not a good time to talk with me or when they're leaving right away. I let parents know the very first time I talk with them that here's why that's not a good idea. So they know that, hey, I'm not brushing them off. I'm not trying to be rude. I'm just, I'm busy. And I'm thinking about where are all these 20 little tiny bodies going and making sure that they're safe. Um, it's also a good time to communicate safety expectations. Um, Talk about social emotional curriculum. Again, not as an extra, but how do you intentionally implement that in the classroom? What classroom management strategies do you have? Maybe what has worked in the past and what hasn't. If you've been teaching for a while, your classroom management strategies change a lot. <laughs> they change based on the students that you've had. So if you're going to say that, you don't want to say it as a blanket statement. You might want to say, I use student-centered practices. Um, I kind of first developed that term at, in social work when it was client-centered practices, um, but it's a real term in teaching as well, student-centered. So student-centered just means that you look at a situation. See? Don't have your dog nearby. Shh. Poor baby. He just sees so many fun things out there and wants to be out there. Sorry. So. Things happen. Roll with the flow, roll with the punches. He doesn't even seem bothered by the fact that he was hit with water. He, he smells like wet dog now. Anyway, <laughs> so um, someone who did the best interview was uh, someone who talked directly to the camera or looked exactly at themselves while they were speaking to the camera in a Zoom conference. That is actually a tip that I give people when they're creating lessons online to share with families and with kids. Because when you look at yourself in the camera and you're watching yourself on your computer, you're getting instant feedback, but it also makes it look like you're looking at the other person inside an interview. So it makes it seem more personal. So a very simple tip is if I were to look at the camera, it kind of looks like I'm looking away. But if I look directly at myself, and my eyes while I'm doing my interview, it looks like I'm talking to the other person on the other side. Don't use the melting pot analogy when you're talking about race, culture, and ethnicity. It's an outdated term. So um, I completely understand where it comes from, um, but uh, in today's culture, we really wanna celebrate someone's uniqueness and individual um, self as well as uh, how we can work together as a community. So, and how can we work together and be respectful of each other? So don't use the melting pot analogy. Um, something that I was taught in social work was to use a salad bowl analogy, which actually I really like because what it means is that everyone has their own identity from where they come from. Um, and nobody is more or less important, but everyone is defined by their experiences, what they believe, their religion, their culture, the um, color of their skin, where they come from, the region, are you urban, are you suburban, um, where do you come from, um, are you from a rural area, those kinds of things define who we are as a person. Um, those experiences define us as a person. And so when we have a unique mix of people, we need to address the things that are happening in our world. And we also need to address the fact that everyone has their own cultural identity and how might different perspectives be different, but how can we agree to disagree and how can we also um, collaborate in a way that is respectful? 
It is not intrinsic to do that. You need to be taught. And we need to teach kids how to do that. How do you plan on teaching that in your classroom? Be specific, okay? You might use sentence frames. You might have rules and expectations, but you also need to say that you have to teach it, okay? It's not something that's going to be natural. You need to teach those skills because they are a skill. And it can be challenging, and a lot of times it's just a maturity level. But it is a skill that can be taught. Um, and it needs to start in the classroom. Um, be succinct, but provide enough information. Um, refer to people as people, not necessarily the color of their skin or where they come from. Mexican people, black people, or African American people, um, people with Caucasian skin color, or Caucasian people, or white people. Just make sure you preface it with people. I think the same thing goes with people who have disabilities, not saying the disabled. <laughs> Um, those are very outdated terms and rightly so and I know that sometimes it depends on the generation you come from and None of it is meant to be offensive, but it can be offensive to some people and um, Things are constantly changing, but we really want to be respectful and value the people that we have um, Use hum uh, humor when it's appropriate um we want to know that you're a fun person to work with, so everything is balanced. You don't want to be all humor and no substance, um, but you also don't want to be all substance and no personality. So incorporate your humor as you feel comfortable, as long as it's appropriate. Um, people want to know that you're an enjoyable person to work with and that you fit within the team dynamic. Um, I know that's definitely important for me because I can tend to be a little too serious, so I love being around the other people in my building who are super... Um, energetic and can just like they just know what to say and you just start to laugh so they want to know that you're a fun person to work with and make sure you end on a positive um, if you don't get that job don't despair there are so many very qualified applicants out there that it has been extremely difficult to score the people who've been interviewing oh my goodness there's just so many good qualities in so many people, and it's a very challenging time. So if the interviewers haven't already told you uh, what the turnaround is, make sure that you ask um, different turnarounds for different positions, different times, um, call for a different turnaround rates. So sometimes um, principals don't usually make the phone calls back. Sometimes they do telling you that you did or you did not get the job. Usually. Uh, for a district that is the size of mine, we're the second largest district in the state of Washington, um, it's going to be HR that calls. Um, it's just a certain protocol, so it might look different for the different kind of school that you're working at. Um, but ask what the turnaround rate is, because like I said, I was not prepared with the fact that we had so many wonderful candidates to um, vet through that we had so many. It took two days. Oh my goodness, these are my first two days. Um, of summer vacation and it's being spent doing interviews, which actually is kind of exciting. It's a great process. Um, but two days worth of interviews because of the amazing candidates. So make sure you ask what the turnaround rate is. Um, you may not hear back if you didn't get the job. So if you haven't heard back in a couple weeks, feel free to follow up with the HR department uh, first if they have one, then the principal, but do not um, harass them. <laughs> Sometimes um, things just take time and paperwork takes time. So our district is hiring a lot of teachers now. We try, it used to be they used to hire them like right before school started. That would be me. I was hired right before school started, like a week before school started and had never taught kindergarten. Whew. It was different. I was told then that third grade is very similar to kindergarten. And I kind of get that, but no. Mm -mm. Or now our district has gotten a lot better and has tried really, really hard to make sure that they're interviewing for positions prior to uh, school starting um, by at least a month or so, so that we can prepare our classrooms because it takes a lot more effort and man, it, it was like, it was very hard preparing um, to teach kindergarten for my first year of teaching, never taught kindergarten and done student teaching in third grade. It was, and in a week. Um, and setting up my classroom for the first time. And for me, it was a brand new classroom. It didn't even have any prior things in there. So it had all brand new curriculum that had to be on anyway. That's a whole, I need to stop. That's a whole nother story. But 
um, just know that HR has a lot of applicants. It takes them a while, so be patient, but also feel free like you can follow up and ask. And, oh, I forgot to include this, send a thank you note to the principal when you're done with an interview. It's just a best practice. Say thank you. <laughs> because sometimes what happens is, guess what? Principals talk in a district, okay? They talk, they might say, we couldn't hire them for this position because we had someone else that was a little bit more qualified, but we would have loved to hire them if we had more than one position. That happens. And it happens more than you think. And word of mouth is still king. So that's still the number one marketing strategy is word of mouth. So build up your reputation and make sure it's a good one. Follow up with um, an email afterwards, thanking them for the interview and the time and just reiterating that you would love the opportunity to work there. Okay, so follow up, relax. Now's not the time to quit smoking. Now's not the time to quit for me, coffee, because I don't smoke, but ooh, coffee. It's not the time to try that new diet. Mm -mm. Finish your interviews first if you have the chance and if you're a new teacher and you missed out on your Zoom teaching experience, it's okay to be a substitute for a while. You missed out on a lot in your student teaching and it's okay to be a substitute because then you can kind of get an idea of more about maybe your teaching style, the different buildings and which buildings that you fit in well. And you can establish a relationship with staff there in a lot of times if there's a position open later, they might just pull you into that interview process. It's the best way to get into a building. So just know there's many, many different ways. So be patient, you've got this. Uh, let me know in the comments section on my website at mycreativekingdom.com what you do to prepare for an interview um, and what you think about the COVID-19 blended distance learning model and how that has changed the interview process. I will talk to you soon. I hope you have a great, wonderful day. I better go walk this guy because he looks like he's looking outside like he's ready for his walk. And I will talk to you soon. All right, bye.